Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. My name's Phil and who are you? Hey guys, I'm Sam. Thank you for joining us for a, another video. We've got World War II Oversimplified Part 2 and we did Part 1 and we asked you guys if you wanted to see Part 2 and they did, so we're coming back to Part 2. I enjoyed it. I'm glad that you guys wanted to see Part 2 because I wanted to finish this and was going to on my own whether you guys wanted to or not. Yeah, I love the little like cartoon animations. I'm here for it. Yeah, it was great. They packed in so much information in such a short period of time. They had some comedic value in there on the first one, so I was all in. I was engaged, and I'm ready for Part 2. You want to get it going? Yes, let's do it. Let's roll. Part two. So what else is happening? Well, when I said Britain was all alone, that wasn't entirely true. Many Commonwealth nations and other allied colonies had joined the war in Britain's support. They would play a key role throughout the war, particularly in the African and Italian campaigns. On the Axis side, Germany, Italy, and Japan signed the defensive tripartite pact, bringing their military alliance even closer together. The Soviet Union's war against Finland should have been an easy victory, but it became a humiliating struggle, and their military ineptitude was put on full display. In the end, they did force the Finns to sue for peace. Then, they continued their honorable campaign of pushing around much smaller countries by annexing the Baltic states and part of northern Romania. France's colonies in equatorial Africa were like, heck no, we aren't going to join the Germans, and they all pledged their allegiance to free France, except for Gabon, which had to be taken by military force. The Allies also tried to capture the strategic port of Dakar, but that ended in failure. Mussolini had seen Hitler's successes, and he thought now it was Italy's time to shine, so he tried to take British Somaliland, and that went pretty well. Then he tried to take Egypt, and that went less well. Then he tried to take Greece, and that went really badly. Churchill began referring to Italy as Europe's soft underbelly. He began favoring a military <laughs> campaign from the south and started sending British troops to Greece. All of this had Hitler pretty concerned, and he moved to protect his southern flank. He had been getting friendly with Hungary and twisted their arm into signing the Tripartite Pact and joining the Axis powers. Romania was also eager to join for protection against the Soviet Union. The Tripartite Pact was designed to prevent any other countries from deciding to join the Allies, specifically Britain's old ally, the pesky United States of America. When war first broke out, American public opinion was strongly against joining in. In 1940, there was an election. The Republican candidate said, I will not send any young Americans to die in Europe, and sitting President Franklin D. Roosevelt said, I will also not send any young Americans to die in Europe. Unless I have to, then I might. And Roosevelt won. Churchill asked him to join the war, but Roosevelt said, no can do, Winston. But you know what? Here, have some weapons. America began supplying the Allies with food and munitions, but there was one problem. German U-boats were sinking thousands of Allied supply ships in the Atlantic, including American ones. If the Germans could sever Britain's supply line, the UK would starve. Throughout the war, the Allies had to come up with better technology to fight the U-boats. Improved radar, aircraft with longer range, better weaponry and convoy tactics. At one point, a man even called a meeting and said, Pycrete, you take some wood, you take some ice, you put them together, you get Pycrete. And then he pulled out a gun and shot some wood and it shattered. And then he shot some Pycrete and the bullet ricocheted off it and hit someone else in the conference room. Then they tried to make a Pycrete aircraft carrier, but that idea was scrapped because that's a really dumb idea. In the end, Alan Turing and his team of codebreakers cracked Germany's Enigma code and the U-boats gradually became less and less of a threat. Back in Africa, Britain decided to push Italy out of Egypt. Hey, that was pretty easy. So just something as small as that, like cracking the code that made such a difference in the outcome of the war because then you allowed to have supplies that are transported to the country that needs it to defend themselves. Like it's the ripple effect, the mm -hmm. dominoes are very important with so many of these things that we've yeah. gone over. And it's also interesting to know that aspect. Like I didn't know so much how the stages of the US involvement came to be in that they were able to sit back and not be involved in the war while they were a rising power in general in the world, right? Economically, they were growing. So that meant that they had a lot of um, development from maybe their you know, researchers and engineers and stuff like that, which allowed them to sit back and develop their um, productivity in terms of a nation and through that they gained a lot of power and were ultimately the cause for the victory right and mm -hmm. then from that they ended up gaining a lot of popularity and power you know over the next decade right so or sorry the next century i should say and so it's just so cool to think about it how you know them sitting back and other people are at war and they're just developing 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 ended up being a huge uh, contributor to the way our his history has now developed from there. Yeah, well, I also find it kind of funny because I feel like, I mean, 
from our standpoint, at least what I was taught, is that, you know, they tell you about the perspective of it from North America, right? So they tell you about what happened in Canada and the U.S. a little bit to of their contributions to the war, but they don't ever really tell you, like, what took place and everything else, like, one, before they joined, right? And two, of all these little like pawn movements that were happening of like, we take this, they take that, we mm-hmm. take this, we take, like, we don't, I never learned about any of those, right? Mm-hmm. Just about what happened once the U.S. and Canada joined. Mm-hmm. I think also too, like from what I understand, sometimes it's talked about like, you know, like you just said, America didn't join until way later, but then they came in and it's like, they saved the day. Yay. We won where it's like, you know, people were really struggling for a long time before that. And that's not talked about as much. And I feel like not taught as much in North America. It's more so of just like, yeah, there was a war going on. And then the Americans came and saved the day. And the Canadians. (laughs) Yeah. As well. So they kept going. Hitler realized he was going to have to finally step in and do something. He went to Bulgaria and Yugoslavia and said, hey, I'm going to move troops through you to get to Greece. So either join us or, you know, be invaded. Bulgaria opted to join them. Yugoslavia opted to be invaded. Then Greece finally fell to the joint German-Italian invasion. The British had moved troops from North Africa to fight in Greece, which helped Rommel and his tank divisions push the British back to Egypt. And they could have kept going, but a small, mostly Australian force held out under siege for eight months in Tobruk, denying the Germans a strategic port city and disrupting their supply line. Despite having some success in the Middle East, the British didn't seem like any real threat for now. Hey, Soviet Union, look out! With three million troops, Hitler launched the largest ground invasion in history, and Stalin was far from ready. Both Churchill and Roosevelt had warned him of an impending attack, but he dug his head in the sand and the Soviets didn't stand a chance. Germany made staggering progress, with huge encircling movements capturing mind-boggling numbers of Russian troops. A quarter million at Bialystok, Minsk, 300,000 at Smolensk, nearly 700,000 at Kiev, and again at Vyazma and Bransk. Leningrad was put under a siege that would last an insufferable four years. The invasion of Russia had been Hitler's main ideological goal from the beginning, and his hatred for the ethnic peoples there was now unleashed in all its fury. The Eastern Front of the Second World War was brutal for all that endured it. The Germans were now inside of Moscow, and that's it. It's all over. But then it happened. It got cold stupid cold. Hitler had hoped the Soviets would give up before winter, but they kept fighting. His commanders came to him and said, can we please dig in for the winter and wait until spring? No, keep going. But oil is literally freezing inside our vehicles. That's fine, keep going. We're having to leave the corpses of our frozen horses by the side of the road so we can still find our way in the snowdrift. Perfectly normal, keep going. Hitler hadn't given his millions of men winter clothing and supplies because he thought he really should have won by now. Then, Stalin called in troops from the Siberian front, specially trained to fight in the extreme cold, and the Germans were no match. They were now being pushed back. They had no choice but to dig in and wait for winter to end. Germany's victories were staggering, and Japan was eager not to miss the victory bus. Their war in China had come to a standstill, but they wanted to keep expanding their sphere of influence and getting those sweet, sweet raw materials. They began making plans to expand southward, but there was a problem. Southeast Asia was heavily colonized by America and Great Britain. It was also full of ocean. Ocean meant naval combat, and there was no way the Japanese Navy could stand up to the US and the UK. So they thought, wouldn't it be nice if we could destroy their navies before we begin our conquest? And so it was. On December 7, 1941, the Japanese launched a surprise air raid on the U.S. Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor and inflicted a huge amount of damage. They also attacked British colonies in Southeast Asia. Roosevelt had no choice but to declare war on Japan, and so did Churchill. Hitler then declared war on America, even though he totally didn't have to. The attack on Pearl Harbor seemed like a big Japanese victory, but they didn't attack any of the naval repair yards, fuel storage tanks, or the submarine base, meaning the Pacific Fleet would be up and running again pretty soon. In the meantime, though, the Japanese were able to begin their conquest. They took Guam, the Gilbert Islands, Wake Island, Hong Kong, and the Philippines. They forced Thailand to join them so they could march their troops through to Malaya. They swept through Singapore, North Borneo, the East Indies, New Guinea, the Solomons, and they were now threatening Northern Australia and the borders of India. Japan's victory had been as staggering as the Germans, and it reinforced the Japanese idea that this was a divine war which they were destined to win. But their victories had been based on speed, not power, and power would eventually catch up with them. For now, though, in all occupied nations, the people suffered. Persecution, forced labor. It's just so wild to think about how much the map was so different. You know, like seeing this country, this country, this country under control of this this nation. Like, it's just so wild how different that is from today and how the results could have been so vastly different if the result of the entire war wasn't so different. Yeah, and that's what I was saying before is like, maybe I just don't remember, but I don't remember like learning about all of these things happening and all of these things being taken. It was like, I feel like there was just a heavy focus on like Europe. 
yeah. in Canada and the U.S. I, I never heard I never heard anything about Japan taking over the areas no. of the Philippines and, yeah. the Hong, and Hong Kong. Obviously, you hear about Pearl Harbor yeah. because you know that's the American history that you're. I feel like about. even that though I learned from like movies, yeah. not from school. <laughs> yeah, and I mean I do remember the um, the battle in the Soviet Union, uh, the large contributor of the weather being a major factor in the results of that war and Hitler basically overplayed his hand and underestimated the the winter mm -hmm. and that played a significant role in the outcome of the war. I do remember that aspect. I also thought I heard at some point Hitler's response was like he gave them drugs or something that I don't know what kind of drug, but basically to try to just allow them to push through it and keep their keep them stimulated. It could have been like speed or something like yeah. that. Or they were literally giving drugs to their personnel to try to get them to just keep going, keep going, keep going. Like he was like Damn. making fun of, right? Just saying, okay, that's like cool, fine, go, yeah. like just finish it type thing. Um, but yeah, I was just so blown away, like I said, by the, you look at this map and like the changes that are happening. So, I mean, not quickly in the respect when you're talking about years, but it is pretty quickly when you talk about the entirety of civilization and mm -hmm. humanity, how fast things can change, right? Yeah, for sure. Harsh punishments for any who spoke out against their occupiers. In Europe, the Nazis were rounding up ethnic minorities and other unwanted groups and individuals. In particular, millions of Jewish people would suffer through the terrible events of the Holocaust. Brave resistance movements rose up in defiance of their invaders, while the people held out for hope. And hope was coming. Winter was over, and Hitler could continue his push eastward. But this time, he switched up his strategy. He wanted to focus on the south. His plan was to cut off the Russian armies in the Caucasus, an area full of oil, and then invade the Caucasus and take all the oil. His forces moved across the north with ease, and Hitler got cocky. He rerouted the 4th Panzer Army south early, leaving the 6th Army to complete the encircling movement alone. To do so, the 6th Army had to reach and take the key Soviet city of Stalingrad. The Russians defended it fiercely, and Stalingrad saw some of the harshest fighting of the entire war. The Soviets held up the German advance for five months as they battled in the war-torn city, which bought them valuable time. When the Germans had first launched their invasion a year earlier, the Soviets had moved their factories to the east. Those factories had been building a butt-ton of tanks and aircraft and getting the Soviet army up to scratch. Now. It was ready. Stalin gathered his new and improved forces around the city, and in an attack that resembled Hitler's own encirclement tactics, they began surrounding the 6th Army. Hitler's commanders came to him and said, hey, maybe we should retreat. But Hitler said, no, no, you stay. The entire 6th Army was trapped and had to surrender. With complete air superiority, the Soviets started pushing westward. For Stalin, it was a resounding victory. For Hitler, an absolute catastrophe. Things also weren't looking too good for Hitler elsewhere. With America now in the war, Allied bombing over German cities reached devastating levels. In Africa, the British had pushed Rommel back again, then they were pushed back again, and finally, after a decisive battle at El Alamein, and with American and British troops arriving in the West, the Germans and Italians were squeezed out of Africa. Japan was also already seeing its rapid success being turned around. They attempted to take the island of Midway, but the US Navy was ready for the attack, and they sank Japan's carrier. Actually, they sank a lot of them. It was a battle from which the Japanese Navy would never recover. British, Indian, and Chinese troops held the line in the harsh jungle terrain of Burma, and the Japanese suffered losses in the Solomon Islands and New Guinea. They began to realize they were not invincible. With the Axis out of Africa, the Allies had to decide their next move. Churchill still wanted to attack from the south, while the Americans preferred a full sea invasion in northern France. All right, said the Americans, we'll do it your way. Allied forces successfully landed in Sicily and began moving north. They also carried out bombing raids over Rome. The thing was, many of the people in Sicily had relatives living in America, and they greeted the American troops quite warmly. With the war reaching home territory, most Italians just weren't that into it, and Mussolini was suddenly very unpopular. He was voted out by his own fascist Grand Council and was toppled from power. Italy immediately began negotiations for surrender. Hitler wasn't surprised and had already sent reinforcements southward. In an operation he ironically called Operation Axis, German troops quickly disarmed Italian troops in the north. The Allies continued fighting the Germans up through Italy, but then winter set in, meaning mud, and everything slowed to a halt. All right, said the Americans, let's do it our way as well. Germany had made itself a lot of enemies, and millions of Allied troops had been gathering in England as factories worked around the clock producing the war material needed for a super crazy massive the likes of which the world has never seen before invasion of Europe. The Germans knew an Allied invasion would come, but they didn't know where it would land. Thanks to Allied deception tactics, they thought there was a pretty good chance it would come at Calais, but the Allies were really going to land in Normandy because it was less fortified and the beaches were nicer. Under the careful planning of General Dwight D. Eisenhower, the invasion that had been long in the making was just about ready to go. Just one thing was preventing the launch, the British weather. For 
For a short while, everyone sat around waiting for a decent day. And then, it came. On the night of June 5th, over a thousand bombers took off and raided coastline defenses, while paratroopers were dropped inland in a bit of a chaotic operation, tasked with sabotaging defenses and capturing key bridges to stop any German reinforcements from reaching the beaches. Early the next morning, the barrage came, as Allied ships fired a huge number of shells at the German fortifications, and then the landings. The Americans at Utah and Omaha, the British at Golden Sword, and the Canadians at Juneau. It was a tremendous struggle with a great loss of life, particularly at Omaha, but the Allied troops captured the beaches and the landings were a success. Then they began their movements inland. They took the port of Cherbourg and the city of Caen. The Americans moved south to capture Brittany. Then, in a massive disaster for the Germans, British and Canadian troops from the north and Americans from the south trapped the German 7th Army in a near wipeout encircling movement. In August, Allied troops landed in the south of France to little resistance. On one beach, all they found was a Frenchman handing out champagne. Paris was liberated, and the Germans were pushed out of France as the Allies entered Belgium. In the far east, the Allies started to push the Japanese out of Burma as the Americans launched a two-pronged offensive in the Pacific. In the south, General MacArthur led the push to liberate the Philippines, while General Nimitz oversaw the brutal island-hopping campaign. American forces had to make hard-fought landing after hard-fought landing on fiercely defended small islands as they moved steadily towards the Japanese mainland. The Japanese believed that the greatest thing a person could do was to die in battle, and the most dishonorable act was to surrender. As a result, they fought ferociously to the very end, and the closer the Americans got to the mainland, the more ferocious the resistance became. In February 19 1945, the Americans captured the island of Iwo Jima, and an intense firebombing campaign of Japan's wooden cities began. The Allies suffered some setbacks trying to liberate the Netherlands, but they were making progress. And I just can't believe how fast we're going from one spot I to know. the next. Like, we're in Europe one second, then we're in uh, Africa the next second. In the Philippines. Yeah, and um, seeing this sharp change, I think, you know, now that we've gotten to the end of the story so to speak we're trending towards the, the final moments i think and now i guess i can see why there's so much focus on pearl harbor because it was basically the inflection point of the war it was the turning point of the war that that miscalculation by japan and germany and hitler by announcing war against the u.s really changed the whole dynamic for everybody because at that point it was they were overwhelmed with enemies and they were not able to contain and compete with the vast amount of forces that were going against them right yeah. so if japan for example hadn't decided i'm going to go in and get my share and all this other stuff then the u.s may not have been drawn into the war canada other countries may not have been as well or to the same degree and therefore it wouldn't have caused the complete collapse because they were overwhelmed by everybody from all these different directions right you had the soviet union yeah. from one you had obviously the from the south and then you had from the west right all you know all sides they were getting hit so all because uh, they were greedy little buggers yeah well i mean that's but that's the also the the aspect of war right is like you get into the thick of it and you're probably not not going to be able to reserve yourself and people are going to get greedy and think i'm going to take this i'm going to take that and you know we've seen multiple instances of this where the uh, impatientness resulted in a sharp change in the outcome. Yeah. Is this influencing the next time you play the game of risk at all? <laughs> Maybe you never know. Yeah. I do like playing risk. I haven't played in a while, but, um, <laughs> it was a game I do and did enjoy. I like the strategic component. Yeah. We'll say. And you're seeing some strategy here. Yes. It's very important. <laughs> clearly. <laughs> and were now threatening the industrial heartland of Germany. Hitler's health, both mentally and physically, was rapidly deteriorating. Things were looking bad, and he was desperate. He said, we need to turn this thing around, and I have just the trick. Remember a few years back when we blitzkrieged through the Ardennes and trapped the Allied forces in Belgium? Well, I'm going to do the exact same thing. Again, he gathered his forces and tried to pound them through the Ardennes. He used up the remainder of Germany's strength and resources, and he managed to create quite a nice bulge. He also trapped some American forces in the Belgian town of Baston. The Germans sent the trapped Americans a message saying, surrender or be annihilated. When it was read out to the commanding officer, he said, they want to surrender? No, sir, they want us to surrender. Nuts! And that's what they sent off as their official reply. General Patton's 3rd Army then managed to break the siege from the southwest, and the Germans were pushed back. Hitler's last-ditch attempt had failed, and what followed was a total collapse of the German forces. The Allies pushed into Germany from both sides. The Soviet Union took Warsaw and kept pushing to Berlin. In his bunker, Hitler realized all hope was lost. Berlin fell, and with it, Hitler's dreams of a great German empire. Two of the Axis nations had been knocked out one to go. The Americans began their assault on Okinawa, the last island before they would reach the Japanese mainland. 
The desperate Japanese fought hard, launching kamikaze attacks on the US ships. The citizens of Okinawa suffered through the terrible fighting, but in two months, the island was captured. The Allies now had to make a choice. Either continue the devastating struggle up the Japanese mainland, or they could try to coerce the Japanese into surrendering now. In July, the first successful atomic bomb test took place in New Mexico, and the destructive weapon was ready for use. America and the UK were also seeing the Soviet Union not so much liberating as occupying its captured territories, and so they wanted to put on a show of force. On August 6th, the A-bomb fell on Hiroshima. Then, on the 9th, Nagasaki. The cities were reduced to rubble, and for the people living there, it was a terrible fate. But for the Allies, it achieved their main aim. In September, the Emperor announced Japan's surrender, saying the war situation has developed not necessarily to Japan's advantage. After six years, war was finally over. The Allies occupied Japan for eight years. The Emperor was allowed to keep his position, but General MacArthur made sure this picture was printed in the Japanese press to display to the Japanese people that their Emperor was not the divine powerful being they had believed. Germany was divided between America, the UK, France, and the Soviet Union. In 1949, the Allied sectors were united into West Germany. The Second World War had been more terrible and destructive than the first. In its aftermath, two major superpowers with two very different ideologies had come out victorious, and the tension between the two of them would create a new kind of war. A very, very cold one. <laughs> wow, Churchill, that looks just like me. And your app is doing really well. And this quesadilla you made is to die for. How'd you learn to do all this stuff? I used the link in the description to get two months of Skillshare for just 99 cents. Wow, tell me more. So that was World War II Oversimplified Part 2. Sam, so what did you think? I like how they do this with like the little cartoons and stuff. I feel like it's really easy to follow and understand. I mean, they move so quickly that I feel like I might need to watch this, even though it's oversimplified, like five times to catch everything. But I kind of wish I had these back when I was in school because I feel like I would have learned better from this than a textbook. But yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think they have the, the comedic value and the creativity with the, the you know, um, graphics and the way they're construing the message with that, with the jokes in between allows you to remember it a bit better. Yeah. Right. You know, like you said, if you were a student and you were trying to recall something on a test and it's like, what, oh, what did he say about that? And there's like some joke in there that might be able to yeah. allow you to pull that information a little bit easier than yeah. as you alluded to in the last video, reading in a textbook or something like that. For Sure. I'm also just like a visual person. Like when I see something visually, I remember it better. Like even like if something is written on paper and I see it like and I'm studying that way, it's like big and there's a picture and I've highlighted it, like all stuff like that versus mm -hmm. just like reading it once in a big blur we're talking about it so. yeah and um it was cool like i said to get the details of this you mm -hmm. know the I specifics so much more about this as a whole than what we learned in school yeah and um you know it was interesting that the main thing that you might remember or one of them anyways would be the atomic bomb um and that was really the end at the end when like it was almost already over. Yeah, like right? the last final. That thing. was kind of the statement. And I think Just if kind of I show of power, like they said. Yeah, I think if I remember correctly, you know, they given they had given Japan multiple warnings, like you need to stop now or else things are gonna get bad. But um, you know, it was kinda like really didn't need to ha have happen, you know, but I guess none of this needed to have yeah. none, none of this needed to happen to begin with. Um but we're here today, yeah. and now that means we should potentially move on to the next oversimplified subject. Yeah. And you guys can let us know if there's a particular favorite you would like us to check out. Obviously, I'm, I'm assuming there's World War One as well. Um, he just made mention of the Cold War. I'm, I'm sure there's details on that. And there's probably things like World War Two is probably one of the most popular events in, in history, recent history that we're aware of, right? Even we didn't, you know, even though we didn't know a lot of the details of it, we still had a general idea yeah. about the theme, the result, all that, because it shaped the world so much. But there's probably things like the Cold War, I know the bare bones about, that would be much more informative that we could check out. Yeah, there's so. probably even things that are like from like way before this. I mean, I don't know For what sure. this channel covers, but like, you know, like Roman Empire history and like Greek mythology and so all that kind of stuff. So many different ones, yeah. yeah. Anyway, so you guys can give us some recommendations down below. We appreciate the insights from you guys. Hopefully you enjoyed part two. If you did, make sure you hit the like button and uh, make sure you subscribe if this is your first time on the channel. The notification bell helps as well. And um, we got to... Get out of here for now, but we'll be back tomorrow. We got two videos everything every single day. We'll see you then. Thanks for watching, guys. See you then.